Hello, this is your instructor, Mrs. Pochnik. For this little lesson, we'll be talking about intelligence tests. This information is from the textbook Understanding Psychology by Robert Feldman, and it was revised by Kathleen Hunt. And the PowerPoint slides were presented by Kimberly Foreman, and I added some things to what she had done, and I will be adding more uh, verbally as we go through it. And the main goal of a, an intelligence test would be to quantify and measure intelligence in an objective manner. And we really want to think about being objective, because that's the goal. But it's very difficult to make a test that is 100% objective, as you will see. So at the beginning, you know, how did they begin? Well, Alfred Binet, he developed the first test. And then along came Lewis Terman, and he designed another test. He revised Binet's test. Then we had the Stanford Binet test that we still use today. But there was David Weschler, and he was in competition with um, Lewis Terman with the Stanford Binet test. And he designed the Weschler test which is the most popular today. And we will be looking at these. The Stanford Binet sample problems that should be answered correctly at particular ages. This is just um, some brief uh, examples. So at three years old, a child would probably know that they have shoes and it goes on their feet. Then at four, they have different um, categories here of learning about certain words and being able to repeat a 10-word sentence. Now this one area here, I wrote in there in red. You'll see my little writing. It says, solve problems such as, in daytime it is light, at night it is. And if somebody's living in Alaska, as you know, it's very far north. And the daytime during the winter is pretty much dark. I think it gets a little bit light in the middle of the day, but it's pretty much dark all, all during the daytime. and it, night during the summer, it's light. So if a child lives in Alaska, this test, they might miss the question. Um, so then it makes it look like maybe that child isn't too bright. But uh, we'll be talking more about validity as we go through. But that's just something to ponder. Then the, another example for ages uh, around six years old. The state, um, they, this is an example, they state the difference between similar items such as a bird and dog, and, and they would probably know that. Now, this one part here where it says solve analogies such as an inch is short and a mile is. Now, if somebody just came over from Europe, they might not be real familiar with our types of measuring because in Europe they use a metric system. So again, Terminology can hinder a, a student from doing well, and they might be very bright, but just because they don't know the vocabulary, they might miss the question. For here, here's for age nine, and so these are just some examples, some uh, verbal problems such as tell me a number that rhymes with tree, and then they have a mathematical equation. Again, here's the sense and if somebody was from another country and they had just moved here and they're trying to take a test and they aren't sure about our types of monetary uh, equations of how we have money because in other countries they have different sources of money so that could be a hindrance. Um, but they probably, most people probably know that one. Uh, the next one is for ages 12. And here's an example, like define words such as muzzle. So there are many questions in IQ tests that relate to vocabulary. So if a student hasn't been ex exposed to a certain vocabulary word, they're not going to probably get the question correct. So is this really a true evaluation of intelligence or just exposure to vocabulary? These are just things to think about. Now, psychologist David Weschler believed that the Stanford Binet test relied too much on verbal skills. You'll see my little underlined emphasis here. So he added to what he designed you know, in his own test, and he added um, verbal comprehension, perceptual reasoning, working memory, and processing speed. 
So, and as you see the the different tests, he has the Weschler Intelligence Scale for children and adults and in young children, and he has them numbered. They have the adults and the children is number four, so that tells you that that each year they're editing these tests, and they do. They're constantly editing the test to try to make them better. The Weschler scale for ages 6 to 16, they have sub-tests underneath their main large categories, and I listed them here so you can see some of the different areas. There's the arithmetic, picture concepts, matrix reasoning, perceptual reasoning index. So these are just the different sub-tests. The key measurement concepts apply to all uh, psychological tests, these three things. So they all have to be reliable. They all have to test consistently what they're trying to measure. They have to be valid. They are supposed to actually measure what they truly want to measure and not deviate from that. And of course they need to have some kind of standardization. So if a person took the test several times they should go up in their score. And if their scores are all over the place and they're low one time and high another and then low again, then they're probably not very standardized. So they really try real hard to make them standardized. And they have to be reliable, of course. So to test and retest, um, as I was saying, that if they are stable, if somebody took the test and they took it several times, they would probably get pretty good scores, but if they changed, they probably wouldn't be very stable. The internal consistency, do all of the items that are specific measures seem to be measuring the same things as indicated by high correlations among them. So that's important. And then interjudge reliability. Do different raters or scorers agree on their scoring or observations? Do raters have different perspectives when scoring answers? If you were being interviewed by, by three different people, would they all come up with the same score of how they interviewed you? Or if you're grading somebody's paper and somebody else is grading the same paper, would they come up with the same score? So that's a very important part here if people would score the same way. Then the validity of test. Um, the main goal, of course, uh, there should be some main goal, you know, and what is it, and they have to keep the questions focused on what their main goal is. Then how valid is it? Is it valid for all the aspects of what is to be measured? Then the criterion, related validity. Do the scores on the test predict some present or future behavior or outcome measured to be affected by the items being measured? So. Generally, tests are to make it look like somebody's prepared for something else. If people do well on, let's say, an SAT test, then it shows that maybe they'll do well in college. So is that a valid test to really give a prediction they will do well in college? So these are important questions to think about for a test. Group differences in intelligence, genetic and environmental de detriments or determinants, excuse me. Are traditional IQ tests culturally biased? Do you think they are? Are there racial differences in intelligence? To what degree is intelligence influenced by the environment and to what degree by heredity? So we will look at these questions on the next slide. And this is from the textbook. The textbook stated the background and experiences of test takers have the potential to affect results. So if, if a person has not experienced something, they're not going to know the answer to a question. Some standardized IQ tests contain elements that do discriminate against minority groups whose experiences differ from those of the white majority. And I have some examples. This is from Gilman, Whiting, and Donna Ford from education.com and they brought up some areas where people have uh, struggled with test. This is an example. Testing a student in English who has yet become proficient in English is problematic and intelligence 
test then becomes a language test. Certain students or groups may have the knowledge and experiences needed to answer the items correctly, but cannot do so if they do not understand the question due to language barriers. Then we have the experience component. How, here's a question. How are soccer and football alike? A student or group who has never played or watched or had discussions about soccer is at a disadvantage. Lack of exposure and experience place them at a disadvantage. And then we have another component. The scoring of an item is inappropriate because the test or uh, the test author or developer would have arbitrarily decided on the only correct answer and the minority groups are inappropriately penalized for giving answers that would be correct in their own culture. So if somebody said, uh, what should you wear in your feet for protection? And if the answer was shoe, but the other person, let's say, only wear sandals in their culture and they put sandals, they'd probably get it wrong. So they would only have one answer and it wouldn't be appropriate according to somebody's culture. This is probably one of the most important parts here. The overarching, que overarching question here is, does the test scores accurately predict how the student or group will perform on a task in the future? It is often presumed that a high intelligence score predicts a high grade point average and success in college and on the job, and so much more. A concern of opponents is that intelligence tests are given too much power, and if a student or group scores low on an intelligence test, there is a high probability that they will be denied an opportunity to access, to access a program or service because of expectations for them are low. So some people are denied access to programs because they don't do well on a test. And that is just devastating. And I think we need to truly work on making tests better. And the last slide I have is what is needed. We need culture fair IQ test. One that does not discriminate against the members of any minority groups. Multiple intelligence tests we need to test different areas of intelligences as Sternberg's analytical, creative, and practical areas and Howard Gardner's nine categories of intelligence. So hopefully this will be something that people can work on and we can have better tests in the future. Thank you.